Okay. For day two, we're going to be talking about a somewhat controversial topic that comes up repeatedly throughout American history, the idea of manifest destiny. As you hopefully have realized by now, uh, Americans often push into new areas, sometimes with a questionable sort of justification. And the goal, of course, is to settle, find new areas to quote unquote civilize and to get a better life for themselves. And so this is one of the pervasive themes within American history, and we're going to look at it today specifically with the issues of expanding to the north and expanding to the south, following up our whole Texas digression from yesterday. So, as we already mentioned, expansionism is a constant theme within American history. Uh, a lot of the artwork from the time reflects that. As you can see here, this majestic eagle representing uh, the spreading westward of the United States. And obviously, uh, the eagle needs a little bit more room for his wings and his tail, and so we're going to try to move into those areas throughout the beginning of this unit. This uh, painting is American Progress by John Gast, and it is usually the qu sort of quintessential embodiment and representation of Manifest Destiny. I'll give you just a second to sort of look at it, but there's a variety of different elements here that I think are somewhat important. Obviously, in the middle, we've got Columbia, who is the spirit of America going westward. Uh, you'll notice that sort of as you move right across the painting, uh, the technology gets somewhat more advanced. Uh, we see our miners in the bottom corner. We see our farmers, oh, sorry, in the bottom middle. We see our farmers in the bottom right. Uh, and of course, you can see who is not part of this image of manifest destiny in the Americas. Uh, in North America, all of the Native Americans and the bison and all the other people in sort of the dark areas on the left that are being pushed out by the quote-unquote light and civilization of Colombia and American settlers. This uh, sense of Americans as pioneers really does sort of build into American identity. It becomes an important part of who we see, who, who we feel like we are, and uh, this was most clearly articulated in an essay called uh, The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, Turner promoted this idea of the quote-unquote frontier thesis, that American culture and American values were developed by the challenges and opportunities of being able to start over, move west, and uh, develop land that had not been developed by white people before this. Turner's, Turner used this to then talk about how this sort of equalizes the American experience, uh, a sense that obviously with one of our core values, sort of the equality of opportunity, as you can see there with the plow, and also the, the idea of the sort of independence of the Western farm. And uh, this was a very important uh, sort of lens to look at American history through. And although Turner was writing at about the time that the frontier was closing, and so uh, when we get to... Uh, next semester, we start looking at where with the frontier closing, uh, that's clearly going to affect both the opportunities that people have and, of course, also the way that we sort of feel about ourselves. The specific area that we're going to look at at the beginning of today was uh, explored and documented through something called the Wilkes Reports. Uh, Wilkes was an army officer who led uh, reports, all of, who led uh, expedition all along the west coast of the United States, sort of uh, charting, exploring, uh, meeting Native American groups and somewhat trying to get along with them, uh, finding uh, exciting narwhals, obviously. And he, he wrote uh, probably the most glowing part of his report was when he wrote about the Oregon Territory and specifically the Columbia and Williamette River Valleys. And so he wrote, writes this glowing report, and this kicks off significant interest in settling uh, the Oregon Territory. Uh, first, mostly missionaries came out there, and uh, there was some conflict with Native Americans, as there always were. But uh, as more and more Americans came in, those conflicts sort of subsided, and Native Americans were pushed out of some of their uh, traditional areas. And it kicked off this huge wave of what's called Oregon Fever, which is a, a huge push, a significant uh, migratory movement across the country 
to settle uh, what, I, what, as we already started calling, the Oregon Territory. As you may remember for last unit, uh, our claim to the Oregon Territory is somewhat sketchy, uh, because, as you remember, uh, Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark out to, uh, as, you, as you can see, chart sort of the Louisiana Territory after that purchase. Uh, their goal, as you remember, was to uh, find the headwaters of the Missouri River, but they uh, went beyond that mandate, went all the way to the Pacific Ocean, which gave us sort of a uh, loose claim on the Oregon, on Oregon Territory, although that claim was also contested by, of course, the Spanish, and, uh, and then later the Mexicans. Uh, the British, a loose sort of claim by the Russians, and then, of course, the Native Americans, whose land, land claims we perpetually ignore. This led to a significant movement along what has become known as the Oregon Trail. You can sort of see this, uh, see it drawn out there. It was a safe passage from sort of the uh, Mississippi River all the way out to Oregon country. And as you remember, of course, one of the reasons why we were settling the West Coast instead of sort of the Great Plains states is one, uh, the climate on the West Coast is much more temperate, uh, you know, significant rainfall, you don't get the same type of droughts. And uh, Zebulon Pike's expedition across uh, sort of the Great Plains had labeled it as the quote unquote Great American Desert, which really isn't a strong uh, a label or a strong uh, selling point to try to get people to move there. The other factor that pushed people out to Oregon, of course, was a, a push factor. Uh, as we again remember from last unit, right around the 1830s, the American economy was blowing up in the aftermath of Andrew Jackson's bank war. Uh, this is our hilarious cartoon about the uh, panic and uh, depression of 1836, where obviously a lot of small, uh, small businessmen and uh, a lot of people who were working in manufacturing went out of business. And so, of course, you know, you lose your job, what other option? And there's no work to be had. What options do you have? Well, you can pack up and head west. Although we're going to focus today mostly on the Oregon Trail, it's important to note that the Oregon Trail was only one of a number of trails heading west, and that the experiences of these settlers on any of these trails was somewhat similar, as were the challenges they faced once they arrived in sort of the, the areas on the west coast. Most of these uh, settlers traveled in wagon trains uh, for a variety of different reasons. I mean, obviously, traveling on your own, you have to be totally self-sufficient, whereas if you're in a wagon train, you can pool supplies, uh, you can hunt together, you can, it, there's better protection from either animals or, you know, Native Americans who weren't super thrilled to have all these wagon trains coming through their territory. And, of course, there were lots of challenges for these settlers. Uh, disease was very common. Uh, specifically, you know, dysentery and other sort of digestive diseases, but, uh, and honestly, uh, it was a relatively difficult crossing where many people lost their lives. The key example that we usually push to of hardship is, of course, the Donner Party. Uh, the Rocky Mountains are a relatively young mountain range, which means they are very steep, uh, they have lots of twisting canyons, and a lot of these canyons end abruptly in what they call box canyons, where you get there and then all of a sudden there's no way out. And so the Donner Party uh, were sold a map with a shortcut out to California, and uh, they took this shortcut and then quickly realized that there was no shortcut and they were just lost in the mountains. And so winter set in, and uh, by the time they were rescued, they had to resort to cannibalism to survive. And so they stand out as like the that could be example of the terrible hardship of trying to travel west during this time period. The main election uh, the ma that dealt with this type of this sort of westward expansion was the election of 1844. In the election of 44, uh, the Democratic Party uh, struggled to sort of find a nominee because, of course, uh, you know Andrew Jackson isn't going to run again. Uh, Martin Van Buren uh, was relatively uh, unpopular because of the whole like economic collapse thing <laughs> that he had overseen. Uh, the Whigs didn't have a particularly good candidate either because, as you remember, in 1840, William Henry Harrison had, of course, died, giving us John Tyler and four years of worthless gridlock. So we can see a very bitter Martin Van Buren there in the back corner. And so uh, the, the Democrats are going to go with James K. Polk, who was the former Speaker of the House, and uh, he agreed sort of begrudgingly to run for president uh, under the condition that he would only run for one term, 
And the Whigs are going to nominate their champion here, Henry Clay, who is the, uh, the rooster up there on the top. Uh, you remember Henry Clay, of course. He was one of the triumvirs and one of the main antagonists to the Jacksonian Democrats. And so, uh, as you can see here in this political cartoon, uh, Henry Clay has significantly more gravitas than Polk and was much more of a nationally known figure at the time. And so, most people assumed that uh, because of the Democrats' previous record, uh, Polk didn't really have a chance. And so we see him here as a, a handsome-looking bird heading quickly up Salt River towards political defeat with a bunch of other Democrats, you know, Van Buren, Jackson. Uh, yeah. The two issues of the campaign was, one, what are we going to do about the Oregon Territory? Because Americans were streaming into Oregon, they were settling it, developing it, fishing on the coast and sort of farming in the fertile river valleys, but we didn't totally own it, or at least it wasn't clear if we owned it. So Henry Clay, uh, as he always does, favored compromise and figuring out a diplomatic solution. James K. Polk uh, had a much more sort of aggressive strategy. Uh, his slogans were only a two slogan uh, that we see here, 5440 or fight where he wanted to claim all the way up to the 5440 parallel, which is way up there in uh, what is today British Columbia, and all of Oregon or none of it. Uh, basically saying that he would potentially go to war with Great Britain to take all of Oregon territory. And this sort of sets him up as a strong proponent of westward expansion, and he becomes the president that's sort of synonymous with the concept of manifest destiny. So, Polk, strong expansionist. Clay, sort of more hesitant uh, compromiser. The other main issue, and the much more sticky one, was Texas. Because Texas is still sort of sitting there as a pseudo-independent country off the coast that wants to be annexed by the United States, but there's enough opposition in the United States that we don't really know what to do with it. And so the Texas question was very difficult for both candidates, because for Polk, of course, he's going to favor annexation, but the problem there is that's going to alienate a whole section of the country. I mean, most, of course, northerners, but also abolitionists. And so, uh, obviously, Polk's going to take a strong stance on this. And Henry Clay, he is going to try to equivocate and not really answer the question. So his position on Texas isn't totally clear. He sort of talks around compromise and, like, really doesn't make a, take a strong stance on this. Most people thought that the Clay proposal, the Clay strategy of not taking strong political stances was a winning one. Uh, Polk would clearly alienate Democrats. We see here Polk uh, is falling into a hole and that the path towards Texas does not lead towards the White House. So again, most people assumed that the Texas question would turn off enough Northerners to throw the election to Henry Clay. But, as we see here, <laughs> It was an incredibly close election. And the entire, uh, honestly, the entire election came down to uh, New York. And uh, New York was as, as close as the actual popular vote was. I mean, as you can clearly see here, there's not like a, there's not a strong geographical component either way. It's not like, uh, you know, Polk won all of the South and Clay won all of the North or any of that. But what happened in New York was there was a strong group of abolitionists uh, who were who formed their own political party, the Liberty Party, where they nominated a guy named James Burney, and uh, there was enough strength of the sort of uh, Second Great Awakening crowd in the burned-over districts of Western New York there that they voted for this third-party candidate, which split the vote. And uh, Burney is one of the early examples of what we call the spoiler effect, where you believe really strongly about an issue. So the people in Western New York believe really strongly in abolition. And so they're not going to vote when there's, there's two candidates, uh, Polk, of course, for the expansion of slavery, Clay sort of not taking a strong stance on the expansion of slavery. If you're a strong abolitionist, neither one of those two candidates is a particularly appealing choice, right? So you vote for a third party candidate and take votes away from the person that you probably would have voted for. Because, I mean, if you force someone to vote for one of the two candidates and you don't like slavery, there's really one choice, right? Clay is an obviously better candidate for the anti-slavery vote than Polk is, but Bernie is an even better candidate. So you take those votes away from Clay and you add them to Bernie, 
which means that Polk wins New York and becomes the president. And so this is the spoiler effect, where by voting for, an, voting ideologically on an issue that you really care about, you end up electing someone much, much further away from your beliefs than the compromise candidate. And we're going to see this a number of other times throughout American history. Once Polk becomes president, uh, he compromises on Oregon for reasons that are going to become obvious tomorrow, because we're going to the idea of going to war over Oregon <laughs> seems less appealing once we're already going to war over another territory that we're going to annex. Because uh, with his uh, campaign, the true to his campaign promise, uh, Clay anne or Polk annexes Texas. And here you see uh, all of the Whigs being pulled into Salt River here. You see Texas coming into the United States and being welcomed in by Polk. Uh, you see the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison in sort of the bottom left there, sitting on a barrel in the middle of political defeat, because he and his ilk voting for Bernie now means that uh, this massive new slave territory is going to come into the nation. So, one of my favorite political cartoons, Texas coming in, absolute, de absolutely devastating for the Whigs, and even more devastating for the abolitionists and the anti-slavery forces. James K. Polk, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on his foreign policy tomorrow when we get into the whole Mexican-American war thing. But domestically, he was honestly not a bad president. He's often referred to as like the last effective president before the Civil War. And so domestically, he passed some reasonable reform packages. Uh, he uh, slashed tariffs down uh, pretty somewhat uh, significantly. He uh, restored the independent treasury. So which is like a pseudo-national bank, which helped stabilize the banking system and operate as like a sort of shadow national bank, but not a national bank. You, you don't really need to understand the independent treasury, but what you do need to know about it is that it helped stabilize sort of the financial chaos that came in the aftermath of the, the bank war. And then he's going to he's gonna end up vetoing an internal improvements bill, which, uh, you know, of course, the Democrats are anti-American systems, so... But Polk somewhat compromises. He does cut the tariffs. He does, uh, he does veto internal improvements. But he does stabilize the banking system. 